Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of A Cup of Joe. My name is Joe Escobedo, and with me on the show today is Candice Chong. Candice is the Business Development Director at Genkiware, based in Hong Kong. So thanks so much for being on the show, Candice. Hi, hi everybody. Thank you, Joe, for the opportunity to, for this show today. Yeah, no, this is an exciting one. I think um, you know, mobile marketing is definitely a hot topic among a d- bunch of different organizations, but I think there's still a lot of uncertainty in terms of what that actually means. So I think for today's session, really would like to get your thoughts on some of the trends you see in mobile marketing, particularly in North Asia, um, some of the strategies that you've seen worked and maybe some of that haven't, as well as how do you actually test and analyze some of the data? Because that's a big part of um, mobile marketing. So Candice, yeah, first off, we'd love to get your thoughts on, once again, some of the trends. I would say that North Asia has been particularly sophisticated when it comes to mobile marketing. So what are some of the things that you're seeing out there? It's a lot of uh, interesting, uh, you know, happening outside, and especially uh, I think uh, China region is actually booming on the live streaming. Uh, I think a lot of people in Hong Kong is starting to have like, you know, a bits of pieces uh, community starting their own uh, live streaming. And mm. so I guess like, you know, um, live streaming have this like, you know, um, uh, you know, curve, it, it make you feel like you're more shopping because actually there's a sales there showing you, you put the product, you have to yeah. feel, you can see the color. Uh, it's actually definitely better than, than the uh, photographs because uh, it's actually more lively and people can show you around, move around and lo- like that. Mm. And uh, so, uh, so that's one part is interesting. And the other part of we were talking about before is grocery shopping. Uh, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are using quick way to reorder groceries. And so they have been jamming a lot of uh, app, apps uh, for mm-hmm. some of these popular, uh, you know, uh, uh, groceries uh, supermarket mm-hmm. and I think that's one of the things that people need to pay attention is the uh, capacity of whether of your traffic you can handle of your mm-hmm. backend server uh, I think that's something that is, is good to pay attention and then because of the brands uh, nowadays uh, everyone is reframed I think especially travel industry so you don't see any like advertisement going on uh, on the social media because for them it's no use to advertise but then as a brand owner if you're selling other products uh, in different categories i think that gave you a probably greater chance because if you now advertise you probably your advertisement always in the front uh, of the of your potential customer because nobody is actually spending much and if you spend less maybe your conversion rate is actually higher mm. no, it's quite interesting i mean we, we started just experimenting with um live stream with my company but it's more for educational purposes we haven't done any like product demos i'd love to get your thoughts on some of some of the brands you think are doing um live live streaming at least you know product demos and things like that pretty well out there uh, I see some uh, like in in Taobao, they actually have a lot of like Tmall, and mm. so they have like you know collaborate with some of these well-known fashion brand. Uh, even those small, medium-sized uh, you know uh, fashion uh, shop, they do it on their own as well. So they would be putting on the dress and show them around and what sizes, what color comes, and so they will just uh, like you know deck it up and just show you okay these are the color and who wants to order and you can because when you see people order right away okay you know Jenny uh, uh, one order and and people want it to be part of the community so you have more conversion rate uh, converted you can see the impact right away. Mm. So if I hear that correctly, you can actually see if you are watching it, um, how many people have purchased the item. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because people will put hand or they will comment and say, uh, you know, I want small size, you know, red color, you know, like that. Yeah. Okay. So more in the uh, the chat area. Yes. Yeah, okay. exactly. Mm-hmm. So you can order in the chat. That's, that's quite interesting. I guess it goes back to, you know, social proof. If you see you know, a lot of people doing it, then obviously you're going to be like, oh, that's something I should be getting as well. Or why aren't I getting that? So um, that's an interesting phenomenon that I hadn't really heard about is, you know, being able to, I guess, order in the chat, at least by your specifications, um, and then get real time updates in terms of how many people are you know, purchasing during that time. But like you said, I guess everything has to be integrated because your, you know, your live streaming has to be integrated with your e-commerce platform or your mobile, mobile platform. 
um, in order to make the purchases? Is it because I'm guessing it's all real time? It's all integrated. Um, I, I I see the um, what the uh, clients uh, does or some of the brand does is actually uh, they will when they have a new collections come out and then so they will say okay uh, we will be live you know by this time eleven o'clock you know they so they do the normal uh, social media or e newsletter or you know they post it on their social media platform. And then tell that, okay, in one hour or tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we will have the live streaming. And so uh, then they will launch the, the, the show, the new products. And sometimes they probably post a few items and so that they know what it is. And I don't know whether you, well, I, you, you know about in Hong Kong or maybe in Singapore, uh, or even though in, in some of these like shopping mall in US that somebody used to have a mic like you know in some department store yeah. especially like yes cooking uh utensils or, or cooking where uh, yes. kitchen where you know that's a type of like you know for all the aunties and moms and going buy like yeah. uh, kitchen aid or something like that and always yeah. there's a counter actually showing you the uh kit, kit, kit uh, you know kitchen where how how to yeah. use it or how good it is and they, they keep talking talking right yeah. and then they were so hot sales and and you can see this is like an old version, right? Yeah. And now it's put it in, into the digital. And this is so phenomenal to see the people are doing. I see like, you know, a different type. Uh, yesterday I, I saw someone, someone was selling some uh, a high speed fan, uh, you know, all sorts of different uh, home products is actually doing live stream. It's not only fashion. In the beginning, I see a lot of fashion, but now it's like even come down to cookware, uh, you know, all sort of home related items. Yeah, that's an interesting phenomenon. And you still see that in Singapore, you see in some of the malls, um, they'll be doing like cooking demonstrations is like testing some of the, you know, the latest, you know, cooking, cooking, and things like that. And yes, it, it attracts a lot of the aunties, but I'm guessing for live streaming, it probably attracts a younger demographic. Um, but going back to your point, I think why those still work very well is there's a lot of showmanship. So whether they're hard selling or soft selling, I think they try to put on a show. And I imagine it's the same on live streaming is you just can't have like, you know, a shirt and say, here's the shirt. You have to, like you say, you model it. Maybe you, you know, you have to, you have to entertain them as well. So do you see a combination of like, you know, selling plus entertainment in live streaming? Yeah, totally agree with you. I mean, some of them are amazed that, you know, some kind of like high speed fan, how long you can talk, right? And they just, yeah. they just keep going. And it's, it's actually usually they, they, you know, it's quite, quite fun uh, to see them as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, like I said, I, I definitely can do, do it. So kudos to you guys. <laughs> yeah, now, you should start doing it. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe that'll be my next career. Well, <laughs> okay. In, in addition to, um, you know, some of the growth we talked about, you know, the rise of uh, whether it was using voice as well. I remember that was one thing that you, you guys saw mm -hmm. getting traction over there. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I, when I, uh, you know, work for, you know, my the technology company, eBay, and I, I'm around with all the young, you know, nineties or Gen Z. Uh, and so a lot of time, I mean, for me, I was keep, okay, I, I insist to type and I insist to write Chinese character because I'm afraid that I'm getting all I, I don't remember. And for them, it's like, you know, they just keep using the voice, like continue using the voice uh, mm -hmm. to, to do that. And you can, for them, because they are digital native and this is such a normal or natural way, they just use the most convenient tools that they can give them efficiency and it's convenient, it's also accurate. And I must say there's a lot of like, like, you know, um, uh, you know, the app or the series, like, you know, is already very sophisticated in terms of the, you know, AI using the big data to, to support. And so uh, I, we see that some of these, like, you know, e-commerce platform or online uh, software company that you can actually, you know, use some of these apps and they come along with the, you know, voice searching uh, software tours mm. and which is very, very, uh, you know, for, for good for, for you attract the young generation yeah. and it's so fast, right? You just like talk a second. And, but the things that uh, I think a lot of people have to think about is because typing is more, um, you write a sentence, it's more complete. Uh, yeah. So it is, it's like a, a proper dial, 
proper mm -hmm. instruction yeah. or dialect, actually you won't have any mistakes because you just, you know, that's the word. And then you, you just search matching the, the word and that's it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of voice uh, searching, uh, on the back end, it, at the end of the day, it's still very much of um, conversational. So it could be that deviation, you know, um, the Cantonese is, is more like a dialect uh, version, right? Mm -hmm. And then VES, the English is actually quite a lot of slang uh, as well. So if, if you don't aware what you're supposed mm -hmm. to. So the, the, there are still refinement at the back end that, you know, your company have to understand that your content, uh, how you matching with the people uh, what they are searching for and then what the most usual questions and whether you can keep improving your your voice instruction to, uh, to be accurate. That, that's an interesting point that I hadn't really thought about but you're absolutely right if you think about the di number of different dialects and, and accents particularly in mainland China I mean it's got to be quite so sophisticated and complicated to, to comprehend all the different nuances because Otherwise, you run the risk of it not understanding you. Um, and I think I've seen some of that here because Singapore is very multicultural. So I will, I actually use voice search quite a lot um, because my fingers are too fat and I don't like texting. But it's interesting because I would try the same app uh, with my you know, Indian colleagues and my, my Chinese colleagues. And sometimes it wouldn't pick up their um, you know, accents or whatever, whatever way they, they said it. So. I, eventually, I think it'll get smarter. I, I know there's ways in which some of them in the back end, you can switch between, for example, even native English, you can switch between um, British English, Australian English, American English um, as an as a, as a option in order to, I guess, better search results. I'm not sure if they have some... Uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, that are good ideas, though, speaking with, with the accent and, and the back end, so your, your data uh, bank have more data <laughs> in terms of that, yes. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense because like I said, not everyone, even if I don't speak clearly, like I tend to mumble sometimes. So if I don't speak clearly, then obviously the, um, I'm using a, a Apple iPhone right now and it's not as good. I've heard Androids are better at, at voice. Um, but uh, yeah, that, even for me, it sometimes it gets it right, but sometimes it doesn't get it right. So it's interesting to see that as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, some, sometimes Singaporean hack actually is, when they speak in it's very strong Singaporean accent, right? Certain word, you know, they, they, you know, they have a different way to pronounce it. And so these, whether that is your app is diversified. Let's say, you know, mm -hmm. if you have clients come from Asia Pacific, right? So how do you cater so many different ways of speaking English? And so maybe, maybe at the end you implement something like that, and, but then it's not sophisticated. People will, will get frustrated and don't come back. And so that have to pay attention, yeah. And I think it's also not only the, the, the accents of the way you speak, but also the, the cultural nuances. Because I remember when I was in China, I lived in China for several years and everyone used it voice. It went on the WeChat. They would send messages you know, directly like this. Um, but you hardly ever see that here. I remember I tried to send one of my friends the message like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you just text me? Um, so it's interesting to see, you know, in China, like I said, they're so used to sending voice messages and voice search that I don't know if any other country uses it as, as much as China does, particularly, I would say in Singapore, not so much. I don't know about the, the rest of Southeast Asia, but I think that, you know, certain countries feel more comfortable, um, you know, communicating with their phones in different ways. So whether it's text, whether it's writing, whether it's voice. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see market to market what the preferences are. Yeah, I mean, I understand like if you, uh, cause I used to work for global, right? And so I, I feel the cultural difference uh, for utili utilizing a mobile uh, phone are so different. Uh, let's say like, you know, in, in, in Germany uh, or in France, they prefer not to get your personal number and because they don't want to be in chase, you know, day and night. Mm -hmm. uh, but certain, you know, uh, country, they will answer you like, you know, if this office hour, they will answer you uh, using the phone. Uh, but if you're talking about Asia uh, Pacific, and most of the time, it's like almost like you know if they are as long as they are awake they will answer you uh so and then 
it, it, as you said, it's, it's so true that I think Asian are more likely to use the voice um, because it's just talking on the phone. Yeah. And I think in general, I think Asian like to talk on the phone more. And um, certain country, I, I, I feel like they like to keep talking. Um, but then in Europe, then people don't like it because they, they find it like it's, it's not um, proper enough. And then in, in some ways, it is, it's actually can be uh, uh, difficult for them to listen to the, to the voice. Mm -hmm. Uh, messages and some of them just refuse to use and they just think it's lazy but then it, it's not it's, it's the different generation that how yeah. the perception they utilize the, the tool exactly so you have to not only think about generations but you have to think of different um you know cultural nuances from market to market um mm -hmm. absolutely now in terms of strategies there's a couple of different strategies um one of which is you know the search another portion is around kind of the payments platform and once again this is why where I think China and particularly WeChat is far more sophisticated than a lot of different um, apps. I know Grab and Gojek are trying to integrate something like that into their platforms, but WeChat was one of the first. And it'd be interesting to see how you view consumers using WeChat. I remember you had a story about, um, you know, buying items in, in Hong Kong when you're in China using, using WeChat. So it'd be good to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think like you know, WeChat's paid and also Ali paid. Uh, also, we have like PayMe uh, from the HSBC. Uh, all these apps is actually giving very convenient. Uh, they have like different types of features. And I think I, I see the Ali paid or WeChat one, they are very sophisticated in some day. I mean, they have already, if you compare some of these like payment app, they're already advanced, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, I think it's 201 or 301 already. And um, uh, they, the thing that we were talking about, if you're looking for CS, like customer service, that you have something urgent you want to, and they have immediately like an icon or somewhere that you can actually find them and you can actually talk to the real person or you can talk in the beginning. Usually they give you like an AI robot. Yeah. And uh, when I look at the questions, they already very refined in a way that they know that obviously they have been running for like, you know, a couple of years. They have enough data. Yeah. And so they know how to set the questions or the categories uh, to shape your questions better, define it so then they, they, they pass it to the, you know, uh, concern department. Mm -hmm. And so, and because of the thing they have launched and the way that, you know, uh, to get you hooked is very easy. And mm -hmm. I must say that uh, it, it is, uh, if I com compare, even though like Apple, Apple like have that feature, like you double click and, and you pay, right? But they are more on more to it because on that Alipay, they have like all that you, you can either show your, your QR code to the person or mm. you have the QR code for the, the supermarket to scan. Or even though the in between that if you have enough uh, stamps, you know, they, they certain amount of money uh, you have spent, uh, and mm -hmm. then you collect five, you already have some like, it's a l so little type of like, you know, a uh, coupon, like three, mm -hmm. three Hong Kong dollars. It's like nothing, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of like aunties and, and mom, they like that sort of thing. They, you feel like you gain something, right? And so you continue to hook like, oh, I collect five stamps. And then, you know, they, they still have that mentality and you collect mm -hmm. the stamp and you can actually buy a pot or something ceramic pot. And, these sort of uh, strategy is really very down to earth and, 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 and very matching the customer behavior mm. and make it like very uh, user friendly and also adaptable and make you feel like a habit because I don't even want to check out my money and count the coin. You know, it's like, you know, I, I just bring my phone to go and grocery shopping. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and I, yeah, it was, I mean, because I was in China in 2008 to 2012, and I think the, the way they've leapfrogged, I think, over most, you know, uh, countries when it comes to mobile payments is incredible. I think even now in Singapore, which is very sophisticated or relatively sophisticated when it comes to mobile payments, they've just now recently introduced kind of like what you were saying is like you can, um, you can send money just by having like the mobile number or someone's QR code. Um, and I know companies like Grab are trying to implement some kind of reward payments where it rewards you for, for using the, the Grab Pay more often, but it's still not readily used out here. I think 
I, I don't know why China was able to make such a massive switch over that night where here it's, it's a very obviously slow process, much better than the States, if I'm being honest, they are in the, in the, in the you know, the prehistoric age when it comes to mobile payments and things like that. So I think Asia is definitely far more sophisticated versus the West when it comes to uh, mobile payments. I, I think it, it could be also is sort of like um, uh, is, is Asia is, you know, some like country like Singapore and Hong Kong, they, they are only like 7 million population, right? And it's, it's kind of quite easy to adopt. And then because the geographic is such a small way. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the most popular area is like in central or in, mm -hmm. in Singapore, it's like, you know, in Orchard Road. And once you have contact, then you are able to uh, work with your vendor and then your client and you join them together, then you can have a, a disruptive, you know, innovations, uh, apps or software to provide uh, mm -hmm. for the, for the market. And, and I think, Asian people in general, they, they like you know, new innovation stuff. Yeah. And in Hong Kong, if you see a new restaurant, immediately there's a line over there. Yeah. And after three months, people say bye-bye, you know, like, like that sort of mentality. Yeah. It's, it's the same here in Singapore. I think, uh, yeah, people are constantly trying to find out what's new, what's exciting, and then try it out. A lot of early adopters when it comes to technology and obviously with restaurants as well. Um, now, yeah. I we talked about last time was around kind of the more tactical stuff. So you talked about, you know, uh, the content, when to share it, you talked about kind of testing and looking at some of the data. So maybe you could share maybe a bit more insight around that. Yeah. And I, I think, um, the, uh, work from home, uh, you know, it's, uh, co due to the COVID-19, I think this totally changed our way of how we interact with your colleague and how your company organized, uh, you know, your work environment, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, part of it is whether your data has been really uploaded to a security uh, cloud server and whether those sort of data is actually available for your staff and who actually, you know, uh, can have the authority to see the the, the data, right? And sometimes, you know, the data not have to be exactly giving you the figures, but as long as you have some graphics that able to show the, you know, percentage growth or comparison, then you can have a good insight. Um, uh, a lot of, um, I think uh, a lot of companies still feel data is, is quite something uh, quite hard or complicated, but the longer or the bigger data pool you have, the um, more insight you're able to draw from. And I think the today's world, I think the human being have to involve in certain ways as well. I mean, I, I, I remember when I used to work in the Wall Street Journal Economist and we are, they, they most of the skill set we probably only have like sales or communication or something. But nowadays it's not only that you you have to combine introvert and extrovert mm -hmm. sort of skill that because you need to look at the data in order to communicate what sort of data externally out that you 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 want to inform your 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 team. Right. And so one part of it is actually uh, you have to understand that for each of your objective marketing strategy or business strategy, you have to look at what is the indicator data you, you require from the indicator then you string down to, you know, uh, the specific, uh, detailed, you know, uh, you think that that data would look like whether it's provide you any good, um, insight, but sometimes you can tell too much data. <laughs> and also yeah. get yourself go crazy, right? Yeah. So I would suggest people looking at, you know, a, a bigger picture first and mm -hmm. then stream down to particular area, then you can put in, I mean, sometimes you don't need to put in like a lot of indicator in order to, to, to give you a bigger picture. Sometimes mm -hmm. even though different timing 
uh, it's already to give you a, a different customer behavior you're already able to understand. So that's quite interesting. We, we talk about uh, uh, like grocery shopping, right? And yeah. so uh, definitely we see like, you know, more than 200% growth, you know, in Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, the One of the company actually was like, you know, uh, losing a lot of money in the beginning. And now they're even making like 200% year over year growth. And so... Then also we were looking at some of these like, you know, shopping index, uh, the, the South Force report shopping index that you can see the people was normally after work, they start shopping on the mm. grocery, on the apps. And yeah. all of a sudden, because you work from home, yeah. you can see people maybe start shopping before the office hour, like, you know, maybe 8.30 in the morning or something like that. And so that they make that task get by the way or if you maybe if you order before 1 p.m mm. then the goods come the next day so this type of strategy that you know your company can actually look at the behavior and what sort of marketing campaign you should do right so mm. uh, also matching with the logistic team right and yeah. so if you do something you forget and, and then that will and then the warehouse people will cry right so yeah, I think you touched on a lot of points that I was going to ask you already is um, time with the logistics as well, because my wife purchased a lot of things off of, um, you know, an app for groceries. And for previously, it was like you get it within one day. Now, during COVID, it's like, you know, three or four days or even a week, because, you know, as you said, a lot of people are shopping and obviously there's a limited supply in the warehouse. So that has an impact in terms of deliverability time and things like that. So, yeah, I also love the point you made around, you know, the, you know, way too much data in the world. And I think people get lost in it a lot of the times, but you said, or if I heard that correctly, your advice was mapping it to like key performance indicators that the business has and then saying, okay, how does that provide some kind of insights to what you're doing? Because otherwise it would be very easy to put together a bunch of dashboards that have, you know, nothing to do with what you're really trying to achieve, but it's something that, you know, you just have another dashboard just for the sake of it. Yeah, I mean, I think company like, you know, big multinational company tend to give you like a sophisticated dashboard. And sometimes the dashboard are so complicated, you totally lost at the end what you're supposed to look at. And uh, it, it gives you like, you know, just complication rather than actually insight. So I, I actually suggest sometimes to keep, you know, some of these like, you know, uh, data or graph or it's, it's more simple just to look at, you know, what's your objective. And because now the, the e-commerce volume is so big, you know what, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the supermarket or groceries, it's very, you can literally compare to year or uh, week over week, mm. uh, that type of sales. And so, but if you, can look like, you know, a quarterly, monthly, and then week over week. The week over week will give you the behavior of the customer, uh, what have they changed. So that is already a very, you know, good way to, to look at. And then, of course, you can draw down to details on that, right? So um, have objective uh, when you want to pull data out. What is your main objective, right? What do you actually want to find out? Uh, ask yourself, you know, maybe five questions only. Uh, don't draw a list of 20, but five. Then they give you a very, you know, concrete and, and defined uh, objective that you know where, where to get your data. Mm. Yeah, no, no, really good advice for anyone listening to this right now. Um, any, any, anything else we're missing in terms of mobile strategies or tactics you've seen work out there? Um, I, I guess a, a lot of... Uh, um, uh, um, now, uh, because of these, like you know, e-commerce business are doing well, and I have recently talked to one of these like content uh, uh, manager that they 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 manage the uh, content of the site, and mm -hmm. a lot of people start uh, shuffling uh, some of these categories uh, because they see the demand, and so they make it either the categories on the mobile apps and more defined and clear. And so that people were able to find those products easily. Um, so this is good to structure, slowly improve certain categories of your product uh, or your services. And so that is more defined instead of just putting, uh, I see some of the website, you know, maybe just put one big uh, uh, category and then doesn't really have the small one or some of them are too detailed. And so, um, you know, have a, a customer testing 
on the certain thing and see how mobile friendly actually is it your categorization so you need some refinement mm. or is it uh, this back search and it's, it's like you know i find some people just uh, some of the apps like you know i just want to click back to see the thing and sometimes it wouldn't it would just jump back to the main uh, page mm. so that give your customers sometimes could be frustration as well yeah, no, it's a really good insight. And I think it, it goes back to traditional retail as well. They always, you know, storefront, they always put the best sellers or the new arrivals there at the very front. So yeah, once again, I'm seeing some good analogies between what, you know, best practices in offline and pulling that into an, an online space. Um, I, yeah, very good points in terms of categorization, finding out what's selling well or what's selling at a certain time and then position that, you know, more prominently on the app. Mm-hmm, yeah. And like in, in recently in Hong Kong, everyone is go after baking, you know, so, yep. you know, put the flour in front page. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. I, you know, electronics for, you know, homeschooling for kids and baking is definitely probably shot through the roof. Toys. Yeah. Toys yeah. also. Oh, gosh, yeah. 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 <laughs> My wife bought tons of toys. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's something like, you know, when you go back to look at your data that you just have to look at which category are doing great, you know, on that week and how is the pattern? Is it the mom is there shopping on the weekend or she's shopping at midnight, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you, you can put, the, you know, those content playing around with it, yeah. These are some super, super good practical tips, uh, Candice, really appreciate you sharing. Um, I think that was everything, like I said, we could probably talk all day. But uh, I guess the last <laughs> yes. question is, how, how can people get in touch with you? Um, I'm, I'm on the LinkedIn, and so people can actually type out my name and find, find me there. Okay, I think we say WeChat or something like yeah. that. No, LinkedIn, okay, perfect. WeChat, yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah, I have a funny uh, WeChat account, so nobody can find me. Ah, I have a nice. nickname, so. <laughs> nice. Well, wonderful. Yeah. Candice, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate you sharing your insights. Super helpful. Thank you, Joe, for that. I really loved, uh, you know, I hope I, I'm able to help your community. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, yeah. a lot of really good points in here. So if you're watching today's episode and you find it helpful, please feel free to share it with anyone who might find it helpful as well, particularly in the mobile and uh, e-commerce space. And otherwise, stay safe and we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much, Joe. Bye.